Through the lens of the ego, the answer is no. And through the enlightened consciousness of the soul, the answer is yes. I want to just take a moment to say good morning to Sonia Kim, who is on, uh, at home watching us. She does this just about every Sunday now, and she sent a lovely note to the three of us that she'd be watching. So good morning, Sonia. We're happy you're here. There was a man once driving along country roads, and he thought he had the directions in his mind as to how to get to the bigger town that he was going for. But he was in the country, and there were just farms around, and he was getting lost. He wasn't, he wasn't getting to the crossroads that he thought was where he turned. So he stopped, and he asked a farmer, how do you get to, I don't know, Chicago? And the farmer said, oh, I can tell you. Yes, you go down to the first crossroads, and then you turn right. No, 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 that's not it, that's not it. Okay, you go two crossroads, and then you turn left. No, no, that's not what you do. He goes, you can't get there from here. <laughs> well, that's, that's our predicament. That's where we start. We can't see God or feel God or touch God or any of that until we raise our consciousness, until we lift ourselves internally beyond this world and into the inner life that we have been given. And we all know we've been given wonderful practices in order to move us in that right direction so we can see how and where to go. So the lens, through the lens of the ego, the answer is no. And through the enlightened consciousness of the soul, the answer is yes. I, I'm sure I've said this before, but, and I, I hope you're going get, to get the point I'm making here, but I've been learning how to do more with my collage art lately by watching people do art. So I watch art competitions where it's either landscape artists or portrait artists. Both of them are equally fascinating, and I learn a lot from them. And there are critics that walk around and talk to the artists while they're, while they're painting. And the conversations are where I really learn a lot. And there was a conversation with the, with the judge and, and the artist. Um, they go around initially when they start. They, the artists have four hours to paint whatever they're painting, which for most of them is really a crunch. They usually spend much more time. So they go around and have an initial conversation, and they were speaking with a young man, and he was not a professional. He was, he was an amateur artist, and it's often a combination of the two, which is another um, way you learn a lot. And he said um, to this young man, I hear you painted a portrait of King Charles. And the man just very casually said, yes. And he goes, how did you do that? And the young man says, I asked. That's it. We have to ask for God's help and God's presence. We have to put out the call. God's dying for us to pay attention to him. And we just ignore. We say, I can do it on my own, or I don't believe in those things, or if it's invisible, I'm not going to pay any attention. Now, most of us in this room, this isn't the case. But this is the way it goes when you're not at the doorway. 
We just have to ask. It's as simple as that. We're, we're kind of being called on the spiritual path to shift our day-to-day -day assumptions about who we are and what we can do and take on the characteristics of the yes, I can kind of person. That's why I like that little story of the artist. How did you get to do that? I asked. Yes, I can. And, and many of our chants speak to us so gently and prod us so um, poignantly. I'm just finding chants more and more just so talk to the deepest point of what we're trying to do when we're trying to see God. And the lovely chant of desire my great enemy, it has the same personal touch. It says, control the little pranayama, become all pervading pranayama, you won't have to fear anything anymore. Isn't that exquisitely lovely? That's God's voice. You know, gives us the techniques. Yes, those take a lot of concentration and understanding. But then puts that phrase at the end of the chant, which speaks to where we are in our humanness and where we, we want to get to a stronger place. You don't have to fear anything anymore. Well, God, God cannot be proved, you see. It's, it's, it's experience. It cannot be proved. It's not a scientific kind of thing. Although, in fact, it is, since this is God's dream. But he, his presence is everywhere. And in India, the phrase is satchidanandam, existence, consciousness, and bliss. Well, that's more than any of us could ask for. We often simply want solutions to our, to our life situations. And there are lots of life situations where we need to call for help. I heard a lovely story. You know, there's a lot of work being done in India these days to help the widows who are often, when, when the family's not around and the husband has passed away, the widows are often just put out on the street. It's just one of those things that's being worked on really hard in India right now. So Ananda does a lot of work with widows, taking them in, housing them, feeding them, um, teaching them crafts, and um, making their lives better. There's a story told of one widow out on the street, and for some reason she wasn't being paid attention to. And she just, in her mind, she felt that she was just going to die on the street. That was kind of she made up her mind to it. It was, it was terrible. It was cold and hot and whatever it was, you know, and she was just there barely getting along. And one day, a man came by and picked her up and took her into the hospital. And she was cared for there. It was about three months. There was a lot that needed to be helped. And um, then she came back out, and hopefully she found a place to live. But one day, when she was back on the street, someone handed her the autobiography of a yogi. This is a true story. She said, that's the man that picked me up and took me to the hospital. It's a curious story, and it, it hit me because there is a sense, even though the circumstances were so severe, there is a sense that she practiced contentment. This is where I am. This is where God has put me. Okay. And I think it was that quality that Master recognized in her and saw her as one of his own. I discovered while I was preparing yesterday a lovely interview with Dr. Peter Von Houten, who is the 
doctor for those at Ananda Village. He graduated from med school and then moved to Ananda. And he saw that, that where Ananda was in the country, um, outside of Nevada City, there was not a lot of uh, medical care being provided. And so he opened a clinic about two miles down the road, and they started in a very tiny place, and they had other, we had other medical folks at the village. And um, so here he was, involved with a spiritual community and practicing medicine. He said that the other doctors in the community weren't too happy because he was such a novice. <laughs> but you know, he was establishing his practice in a place that didn't have medical practice. And his people were those people on the edge of society. They were homeless, they were under addictions, whatever. He took all of them in and took care of them. And there was a story of one man who would come maybe every three months or so, get a prescription from Dr. Peter, take it home, um, feel so good after his interview with Dr. Peter, put the, put the medicine down, noticed it maybe two months later, his three-month appointment was coming up. He went, he went to see Dr. Peter. And Dr. Peter sort of caught on to this. And he said, why aren't you taking the medicine? And he said, you're the medicine. I feel so good when I leave here that I don't need it. And then I forget about it. And so Dr. Peter talks a lot about his own progress spiritually, he says that he always had great devotion for God all through medical school. He was in that mode. But he found it harder to express that love for others. So look where God put him. It's just, it's just magnificent. And he said eventually he was able, because most of his staff were Ananda folks and on the spiritual path, he eventually was running that practice through love. And it took a lot of hard work, a lot of determination. And he said he began to feel God's presence moving through his practice. You know, it would become, he, he was like, you know how, you know, this is the doctor that responds in the middle of the night. This is the doctor who makes house calls. I don't know if he mentioned house calls, but could be. Anyway, he was working and working and working, and he just wasn't sure whether he should be doing this. I mean, how to balance the life, how to feel God, how to see God, how to know God, and how to serve with love his patients. He asked Swami Kriyananda, should I be doing this? Should I, is my dharma somewhere else? This is just a bit much. Swami said, this is, this is your dharma to serve. I want you to stay with it if you can. And so he just made up his mind through his meditation, through his prayers, to keep doing it. So that where the call was for help was the call from God for him to do it. And he became an incredibly, incredibly strong spiritual person that way. Um, he, be, he began to see that eventually there were going to be no boundaries to his energy. You know how we like to say, well, I've had a long... I, I find this funny. People say to me, my roommate even says it, well, you've had a long day. Uh, when you put out a lot of energy, but you know, every day is the same. <laughs> the, every day is a long day, you know? But Dr. Peter had to really, really work with that because he had no idea whether his day would extend beyond 16 hours or not. And one day he got to the place where he said, God, I'm going far beyond what I think I can do. 
So you've got to help me. And this is where another uh, chant comes in. Open your heart to me. No, this is our purification. Open your heart to me and I will enter and take charge of your life. Okay, another renewal in his, in his practice. And finally there came days when he would be sitting with someone who had a condition that he had no idea about, his mouth would open and he would prescribe. And the patient would go out with the prescription and he'd rush back to his medical books and he'd look it up and he had given exactly the right prescription. So I'm telling you this story because this is how integrated our lives can be. This is how integrated we must be. God must be always on call for us, and he is. It's not as if he's trying to decide whether he's going to be on call for us. He, he is on call for us. So then, you know, the, our nearest and dearest friend, which, which Yogananda says is God, we, we don't always get that if we hold him sort of off in ceremonies and rituals. We must bring him really close. Then we begin to experience the highest octave that we are. And the promise of the scriptures is that we also can have that experience of inner bliss and inner awakening. And so we give up. We need to give up the I know better person and just know that with God, anything is possible. So this quality of contentment, it's always very interesting um, to see what affirmation Swami Kriyananda, who's the founder of Ananda, what his affirmation is as juxtaposed to the topic. And it's interesting contentment. So what I thought I'd do is take you through a visualization, if you would be willing. So why don't you close your eyes and concentrate on your heart. Take a few deep breaths to calm the feelings there. Now inhale deeply and draw all the energy from the lower spine to the heart. Now imagine your heart as a lotus. Direct the petals of this lotus upward to the brain. Feel the energy flowing from the petals up past the throat chakra, past the medulla oblongata, and flowing until it becomes centered at the point between the eyebrows. Feel supreme contentment in the flow of energy rising from all points of your body and becoming centered at this point, the Christ center. Thank you. And then to end this morning, I want to tell a little story from the book Out of Africa. When Isaac Dennison and her friend started to fly a little airplane, and their, the friend on the ground, an African lady, came rushing up to the plane one of the first times that she saw them do this. And she said, you were up very high today. We could not see you, but only hear the airplane singing like a bee. Did you see God? And Isaac said, no, we did not see God. Ah, then you are not high enough. But now tell me, do you think you will ever get high enough to see him? And Isaac said, no, we will not. And she said, then there is no reason to fly. <laughs>
but we know it's our destiny to fly to God. Thank you. Oh, I want to read. I need whispers. May I behold thee above, beneath, behind, around, wherever I turn my gaze. Train the children of my senses never to stray from thee, who dwellest at the heart of everything. Turn my eyes inward to thy changeless beauty. Attune my ears to silence, that I may hear thy subtlest music. Breathe on me the heavenly scent of thy presence. Orient wise, I will worship thee, placing the candles of my five senses on the altar of my love. Thus I will contact thee in the first pale shafts of dawn, absorb thee in the high light, bright light of the moon, expand in thee with hidden glow of twilight, merge in thee in the silver moonlight. Always, always will I keep a light on my inner altar, mystic taper of my love for thee. <laughs>